Let's go to First Peter, and we'll kick it off. You know, have you ever stood up to speak about being fearless and then you're fighting your own insecurity? In light of that, let's go to 1 John 4. <laughs> we get 17 and 18. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on that day of judgment because in this world, we are like Him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Amen. I'll talk to you tonight about a fearless kind of love, one that gives you eternal perspective. The title for tonight is lucid lovers and glory hounds. Lucid lovers and glory hounds. Let's go to, back to 1 Peter 5, in the second verse. Be shepherds of God, God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Shepherds of God who are willing. We testify that God can use men whose hearts are willing. Anybody sitting in here at times feel a little bit inadequate for what God has called you to do? Yes. A little bit overwhelmed, like the task is too much for you? Keep in mind, willing hearts. Let's keep going. Let's move backwards. 1 Peter 2. 21. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the trees that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Man, so you guys are LCMF. We know not to say that I'll die for Christ on that day, that I have to die for Christ now. But in my own personal life, I found myself dying for Christ on the weekend. Dying for Christ at the next mission trip. Ray, when we were in Peru about this time last year, was there anyone that we did not preach, tell about the gospel or pray for when we were on a bus, when we walked into a restaurant? Was there not a witness everywhere that we went? No. Nick, did we not pray about what city we might enter, knowing nothing about it? We did. Teresa, when we got there, did we not heal the first lame man that we saw? Do we not demonstrate what the Holy Spirit's power is? See, the Lord spoke to me a couple weeks ago about treating my workplace like it was ministry, like it was being at F-Bar. How are you doing, Harry? Like it was being in the jails and preaching the gospel. See, as Christians, it's easy to learn that we must be bold. But when? Are we bold just on the streets where there's men who are known for wickedness, or men who have been thrown in a jail and are known for wickedness? Or is it in our daily life? Is it with our family that we see at Thanksgiving? Is it with our family that we see in the hospitals? Is it with the people that we work with all day? Because it's all too easy to go preach the gospel and then leave. That little thought creeps in, I've got to live with these people. I've got to work with these guys. (laughs) It's not just show up and evangelize and then leave, but that daily struggle for righteousness. Amen. It says that he made no retaliation. 
Who here, when you're insulted, doesn't want to defend yourself? But the example that Christ said himself is that you will be persecuted and that you're not allowed to defend yourself. He died to bring us life. Let's go to 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Have you ever lost something or tried to find something inside your house so you retraced your steps? Yes. We're going to continue to retrace our steps through Peter. Brother Nick shared a word with us Thursday night. They made the next day different for me. I had to seek the desire to be persecuted, to go through a phase where I was in submission to God and I was no longer suffering for judgment or stupidity's sake. And then once when I was in right order with God, I learned to obey Him and suffer for righteousness' sake. And I began to read and go further and further in the opposite direction. 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you, as aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on that day when he visits us. <laughs> so who knows that it glorifies God when a sinner returns, when he cries out to God and he's born again. That's you all agree with that? Yes. Though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on that day when he visits us. Our hope is always that they'll turn, that they'll see those good deeds and repent. But did not say that it was dependent upon that. When men revile and reject you because you chose to preach righteousness, because you chose to uphold a godly standard, it'll be a testament on, on that day whether or not they repented. It's not dependent upon the result. We're dependent upon obedience to the King of Kings. Amen. Alex preached a little while ago, and he said, if you're doing anything that you can't call the will of God, if that's not your reason for doing it, you're probably in sin. So regardless of what the effect is, when you have enemies of God because you preached righteousness, it brings glory to his name. Amen. And they will testify on that day of your good deeds. Hmm. Exodus 12, 12 speaks of God bringing judgment on the gods of Egypt. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. See, the reason that those enemies testify to the glories of God, even if they didn't repent, is because they're serving the gods of Egypt. Those gods in their life that they are serving, your testimony against every time that you speak kind words, every time that you speak truthful words, every time you uphold that godly standard, whether or not they reject it, it's judgment on those gods. In your life, do you see judgment on the gods of this world as God's job only? Do you see that as something that you do on Sunday when you come to church and you try and bring a friend? Or do you see that as your mission every time you wake up? I'm bringing judgment on the gods of this world that have enslaved men, that enslaved me once, and will enslave men no longer. Let's go to chapter 1, 10 through 12. Still in First Peter. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that has come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them, and they were not serving themselves but you. When they spoke of these things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel, to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24, it says, To this you were called, that die to bring life. To this you were called. We were called the things that angels have longed to look into, that the prophets of old longed to look into and could not. The glory and the suffering of Christ. Because those two things go hand in hand. 
It's a thing to be honored when men are willing to risk their life and go to Mexico to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to hand out food to the poor and needy. But is that the only thing we're going to do? What about those of us who can't go? Because not everyone in the room is going to go to Mexico tonight. Because they're pouring their lives out. In the next couple of days, they've done everything they can. What are we going to do tomorrow? Because I'm not, I'm not satisfied. I'm not going to be left out because I couldn't make it on the Mexico trip. Come on. What glories of God will you suffer for? What are you willing to suffer for? Because if perfect love drives out fear, it doesn't matter what the consequences are. See, in America, we hear over and over about God's love. If I can tell you the number of times I've heard that God is love at F-Bar, I do not have enough fingers, toes, and probably most of the men and women in the room. But what about our love for God? Do you love him enough to act even when it's hard? Do you love him enough to participate in that suffering? Because he showed me ways that I could participate in his suffering a couple times in a week, you know, I had my camp, the guys at work had their camp, and, you know, hey, what'd you do over the weekend? Oh, I did so-and-so, I you know, laid around, I did nothing, and my service for God was telling them what I did over the weekend. But what about the other five days a week? Now, this is my own personal life that I'm putting on display for you. What in your own life have you dedicated to God in a 10% kind of way? 20%. Is there an 80, 90? Is, is there any percentage of your life that is not suffering for glory? See, for me, I treated the weekend like ministry. And then, you know, I was a Christian at work, but it wasn't my ministry. I didn't pray and wake up and say, how might I suffer for your name? How might I bring glory to God? Or they repent or revile against me. It's a testimony. And in my own life, I had to cry out and say, Lord, I need, I need you to help me love you more. That sounds like such a strange request to ask the one that you're supposed to love to help you love him more, and yet he's faithful to do it. Amen. Is there fear in your life in an area that, you know, just kind of looked over, that holds you back from speaking when you should, holds you back from doing what you know is right? See, I know it was in my life. I worked there for about a year and three months now and went all over the world preaching the gospel. I've been with these pastors following in their footsteps. And yet, a year and three months went, probably a year and two months went by. And I had my camp and they had theirs. If they asked me about it, I'd tell them, how long are you willing to leave the lines, boundary lines in place? See, even Sweden would defend itself if armies marched in on them, if they encamped on their national buildings. Is that the kind of Christianity that you want to be called to? If they ask me what I did over the weekend, I'll tell them. If I get the opportunity to share what's going on and not make it practically apply to the sin that they're sitting in. See, I sat on my boundary lines too long. Eight through nine in First Peter one speaks of an inexpressible joy and salvation that is produced. Let's go ahead and read it. For you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And the former verse says, an inexpressible and glorious joy. See, men think about suffering as gloomy and terrible, and yet it says that it produces an inexpressible joy. When you think back in your life. Have you been the most happy when the Lord was moving on you and you were doing things that were difficult? Think about when you were first born again. Was, this joyous, was it this joyous occasion, even though what you did was hard? It could be hard to repent. It could be hard to stand for God. But the point of that suffering is to bring glory. You see, as we participate in Christ, you know that righteousness is credited to you, right? That's... Because none of us are holy in and of ourselves, but obedience to God credits to us righteousness. See, that same glory, honor, and praise that was attributed to the King of Kings gets attributed to us with that righteousness. Are we satisfied just having been redeemed and not then bringing the one whom we love glory, honor, and praise and participating in it? Lucid lovers and glory hounds. 
Is your love cause you to see clearly? Perspective, eternal perspective, and for you to seek glory? Not for this time, but for the time to come. Let's go to 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible joy. I praise, honor, and glory. I would like to be called a glory hound. That's not exactly a term that anybody wants used about them. Lucid lovers, it sounds like a dirty word. Lucid means to see clearly. Do you see clearly because of your love for God? Or is your own fear and insecurity clouding it? See, because I've sat in the same seats as you. I've went around the world with these men. And yet, the Lord's showing me areas in my life that I wasn't quite seeing clearly. That there was more fear and insecurity in there than I realized. That there was not quite that hunger for the glories of God that there should have been. Well, you sit here. Is there an area of your life that you need to be opened up? You need to love the Lord more for? See, 1 Peter 5, 2 says that the willing shepherds, 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24, says that we die to bring life like Christ did. <laughs> and 10 through 12 in 1 Peter 1 says that we will inherit eternal glory and honor and praise, and it will bring us great joy. The willing and the obedient die to bring life so that they will inherit eternal glory and honor. And it brings them great joy and an inexpressible joy in the salvation of their, of their souls. Amen. Let's go to Joshua 14. Have you ever read about Abraham and right after he sins, the Lord speaks to him? Have you ever gone through our Bible studies and you see those moments where it looks completely hopeless? His sons were a huge <laughs> disgrace and he had no faith for God to protect him. Then the Lord speaks another promise. About two months before Sasha and I got married, the Lord spoke to me out of Joshua 14. And I was just kind of disgusted with myself out of my own sin, my own inadequacy. And he spoke 6 through 12 to me. Now the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephun, the Kizite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brother who went, however, father, I'm sorry. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So that on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever. How important is it to hold to the convictions God has given us? Pretty important. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years <laughs> since the time he said this to Moses. While Israel moved about in the desert, so I, here I am, 85 years old, God promised you something that you're trying to hold on to the faith for because you know that it's going to come about, but it doesn't seem like it will? Take Caleb's testimony. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. When we are not ready, when we are at our weakest, God will make us ready on the day of battle. But we need to be in a place where we have to have his help because if the battle is easy enough for us to do in our own strength, why a miracle? Now give me the hill country that the Lord promised me on that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. The Anakites had giants like Goliath in it. You can go back and read in Genesis 6. These guys 
or the same area of the world, same people groups that had Goliath in it. And it was named for Anak, the greatest amongst the Anakites. Their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Who here has a task performed that the Lord has promised? But it feels as if there's no way. I'm too weak. <laughs> I'm past my time. I haven't learned enough to do this. But Caleb's heart said, the Lord helping me, I will. Amen. Is anybody in here tonight who says the Lord helping me, I will accomplish? Because they feel their own weakness. But they love their God and they trust him. See, I needed that love for God to rise up inside of me for every area of my life. Because too easily things have fallen asleep. Too easily I've focused one part of my life and poured out everything I had and neglected others. But we're called to be full-time Christians. Now, can you think of an area that is like Hebron that has giants in it? So for me in my workplace, just because it's an easy example, there's a couple of guys that are particularly hateful, foul, filled with the spirit of the world and not the Holy Spirit. One who openly says that he hates God and he doesn't need him. One who attends a church and lives completely contrary and sees no problem with it. I'd take the, I'd take the first out of the second, but anyway. Those are the Anakites in my life. Those are the hardest ones that I knew how to bring the gospel to. Is there a giant in your life, whether it's someone at your workplace, in your family, or an area that you've never had complete control of sin that have dominated you, that you need to declare war on and say, enough time has passed. The Lord promised I would have victory over it. I'm declaring war on it now. Amen. I'm done sitting in my boundary lines. See, it's easy to set up your kingdom and theirs, and if there's some crossover, you talk. And we want to preach everywhere we go and use words when necessary. And this is all true. But what nation conquered another by sitting in their boundary lines and waiting for the other to submit? You see, if we don't preach the gospel, if we don't have a chance to display godly character... And godly character is displayed when you're persecuted. It's when someone spits in your face and you respond like Jesus did without retaliating that we actually get to advance the kingdom. They actually did get to display what that kingdom is like, what the difference between the two is. Let's go to Acts 10. One through four. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. A centurion in it was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who called him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. It's a consistent theme. What is it, Lord? He asked the angel, Your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. And he gave him further instruction. And it brought Peter to him and taught him about the baptism in the Holy Ghost. What kind of memorial are we going to offer? Because I assure you, Caleb's only memorial was not Hebron in the physical land. There was a memorial in heaven for that kind of faith. What kind of memorial are we leaving? Because there's a lot of memorials. They're not all in heaven, though. See, it's all too easy to know about a Savior, to sit amongst believers like this who are ready to go to Mexico to die for the gospel and not be fully submitted yourself and not fully drive out fear yourself. See, I grew up in this church and up to about a year ago, I was asleep in the light. I had experienced the gospel. I had preached the gospel. I had seen his power work from my laying on of hands. And fear was so dominating my life 
that there was, there was not that resurrection power. See, you can sit in a church like this, because I did. And when you die, and you walk up and you're expecting a palace, uh, an amazing memorial in heaven, and you're denied entry. I don't want any of you to be denied entry. Because I sat in the same seat. And if there wasn't serious repentance and a resurrection power in my life, I would find myself scratching at the doors of heaven. And no memorial would have been given. See, but the thing that saved me is I knew that there wasn't going to be a memorial in heaven and I must do something about it. When you assess your life now, is there going to be a memorial in heaven for you? Or are you going to be destitute and have no place in the kingdom of God and thrown out with the lost? One of those without the wedding clothes. One of those soldiers who shrunk back. Let's go to 1 Samuel. I have trouble not preaching on Samuel. It doesn't seem to matter what topic I pick. There's always some of it that's worked in there. Any of you guys have a book of the Bible that has spoken to you over and over and over? And you pursue the entire Word of God, but something about it just strikes your heart a certain way? I said 1 Samuel, right? Not 2nd? Yeah, 1st. Good. 1 Samuel 2, start in the 8th verse. He raises the poor from the dust, and he lifts the needy from the ash heap, and he seats them with princes, and he has them inherit a throne of honor, for the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. Upon them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. That's scary. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed one. It is not by strength that one prevails. See, Hannah was a barren woman who was persecuted day in and day out by her husband's other wife. I think you got problems. Her husband's other wife persecuted her day in and day out because of her inadequacy. Picked on everything about her that she could find. But this little barren woman's heart cried out to her God. And she was answered with thunder from heaven that silenced the mouths of the arrogant. And the fruit of her labor was Samuel. Samuel was her memorial in heaven. Samuel brought kings up and he brought them down. (laughs) Samuel shaped nations. What will the fruit of our lives be? Is it going to die with us? Are we willing to pour out everything that we have into men so that they'll do more? Are you willing to die for your brother? I believe it's Proverbs 17, 17. Pull it up. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. If we're not ready to die to bring life for our brothers? What's the point of speaking to the lost? We must be ready to pour out our own hearts and lives so that our brothers will succeed, so that they may shake a nation, so that we can help advance the kingdom of God where it doesn't bring glory here. Because if we're seeking appreciation in this life, we'll have none in the next. See, this little woman who was chided, who was berated, her husband didn't didn't value her enough just to have her alone. He wanted to. And you see, he was kind to her. He did good things. But God heard this woman's prayers. And he gave her Samuel. And she dedicated it to the Lord. The fruit of our life is supposed to be a fragrant offering before the Lord. Supposed to lay it down expecting nothing in return. Supposed to pour out your heart for your brothers, for the lost, and there'd be no reward for you. You say, Lord, give this to me so that I can only turn and give it back to you. What can I sacrifice so that it might be pleasing before you? David's words 
to Aruna when he offered him that threshing floor, ring in my ears. He said, I will not bring to the Lord a sacrifice that cost me nothing. Are we looking to bring him something that cost us nothing? See, that little child cost her everything. <laughs> she wept before the Lord for him. Men called her drunk. And she was burdened by her own inadequacy and her desire to produce life. See, but in the first chapter, in the 19th verse, it says, Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and they went back to their home at Ramah. Elkna lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. See, the Lord remembered her. When we're ready to lay down appreciation in this life, ready to lay down our bodies, our time, our pride, our fear, the Lord will remember us in the next life, and there'll be a memorial in heaven. So dedicating everything you have to drive down to Mexico, the Lord remembers that. When you are writhing in pain from a back injury and you cannot be compelled to miss a service or a teaching and no doctor has been able to help you, the Lord remembers that. It's a memorial in heaven. Praise, glory, and honor will be attributed for it, though there's no praise for man for it. When you hold little babies in your arms, they were not born perfectly healthy. But you smile and say, nevertheless, God, he will raise her up. Amen. And you use it as a testimony to all of those around you, to your family who know nothing of the resurrection power. There's a memorial in heaven for that. Amen. But are we going to let one-time instances in our life be a memorial? Because aren't we called to be full-time Christians? Amen. Put Matthew 10, 8 on the screen. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely give if you received as you freely... You have freely received, freely give. As seven say, verse seven, as you go, do these things. Yeah. Not as you go on a mission strip. Not as you go to F-bar or the prison. Not as you go to church on Sunday. But as you go, when you're in Mexico, when you're in your workplace, when you're in a home, you preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. You raise the sick. You heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. You do the work of God everywhere that you're at, fearlessly, because you love him. Amen. Not out of some special willpower because we're better men than the rest. I can tell you, probably weaker than most. But the Lord God working through me, I will take that land, as Caleb said. The Lord God working through me, we will. Nick preached a few weeks ago about a distinction, a line, that separates the Israelites from the Egyptians. See, this is what separates us. When we fearlessly obey, we put ourselves in a situation where we must see God come through or we are bankrupt. In my workplace now, <laughs> they've shoved... Every man who calls upon the name of God and takes it seriously into a one corner of our 10,000 square foot building and they insulate themselves as much as possible because there's conviction even without words. See, we preach the gospel everywhere we go and when it's necessary, we use words. The only way that that works is when we obey what we see in here. See, it's no longer necessary to use words because we preach the gospel everywhere that we went. See, I'm not content just to spend a year with someone who's on their way to hell, and them not see a chance for salvation, not see that resurrection power. And the only way that they see it is when they see it at work in us. When you wake up in the morning, are you praying for those who persecute you? Are you praying for the opportunity to demonstrate Christ's love? As Alex said, if you don't believe it the will of God, you're probably in sin. Has there been a day gone by where you spent eight, ten hours and you didn't consider what the will of God was? Just getting engrossed in your work? Next house? next car, next product. I know that I have in the past, but I've resolved to change that. I'm not going to go another day where I just wake up and go about my business. 
because I'm about my father's business. That's what every one of us are called to do. Let's go to Acts 4. Who loves the book of Acts? See? Who loves the book of Acts? Oh, come on. Who loves the book of Acts? Yeah. Ray, when we preached the gospel everywhere we went in Peru, did that not look like the book of Acts? Yeah. <laughs> it did. And that feels awesome, and it's completely true. And has it really been a year since my life has looked like the book of Acts? <laughs> has it really been since that last mission trip or that great move of God where it looked like the book of Acts? See, the Lord spoke to me out of this. <laughs> Every day is supposed to look like the book of Acts because we're Christians. It's called the Acts of the Saints. Are we not saints of the living God? That's not for a galaxy far, far away and a time long ago. It's for men like us. Acts 4.13, which we're going to read in a minute, says that Peter and John were ordinary men, but they astonished those Pharisees because the Spirit of God was in them. They performed miracles and they did things that were not of natural nature. Before we do that, though, let's go to Acts 4, 31. So you remember how in Peter we started at a scripture and then went upwards? as if we had lost something or were searching for something that was just barely hidden beneath the text but was missing. 31 says, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Amen. Have you been filled with the Spirit of God in a way that you speak the word boldly? Does it shake the very room that you're in? Verse 30, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They preached, spoke the word of God boldly, and they stretched out their hand to perform miracles. Verse 27, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servants whom you anointed. He appointed Gentiles to conspire against the ones who spoke boldly, performed miraculous signs. Verse 28 says, though, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together. 26, I mean. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and his anointed ones. <laughs> they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke boldly. They performed miracles and men rose up in opposition to him. But God spoke in the midst of that and he said, it's not they alone that you oppose. You oppose me. They represent my name. The Lord's anointed are the same as rebuking Jesus. It's the same as opposing Christ himself. How much more so should we be at war with sin? How much more so should we uphold a godly standard if we're going to participate in that same glorious suffering? Verse 24. When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God, Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and everything in them. Their response to this persecution was they raised their voice to God. Is your response to persecution to retaliate, to want to defend yourself, to uh, be frustrated and angry about it and fill in whether fr whatever phrase comes to your mind when you're angry? Talk about it with your brothers. Lament the injustice that happened. It was our response to cry out to God like Hannah did, like Caleb did, though she was barren, though he was too old. All the way up to 19 now. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. <laughs> they spoke boldly. 
They performed miraculous signs for the world to see. Opposition rose up, and God said, It's not you that they oppose, but they oppose me. And they cried out to him, and he gave them power to stand up against anything that came their way. Amen. They obeyed God rather than man. Amen. What was the result of this? Same chapter, scan down now to the 32nd verse. So now going in chronological order, as opposed to the opposite backwards way I just took you through it, they would not yield to man. They cried out to God and he said, it's not you that they oppose, but they oppose me. And when men rose up against them, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke boldly anyway. Verse 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the res res resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. So you mean to tell me that the result of speaking boldly, even when it wasn't favored, when it was frowned upon, meant that Proverbs 17, 17 was true, that brothers were formed in adversity, that every need was met, that every need that we have is met when we speak boldly against all consequence, against the word of the world, against kings that were been risen up against us. So they had no needy persons amongst them. Don't let fear in any area of your life keep you from doing what the will of God is. Fear that you'll be provided for. Fear that you'll have the wife that you've been asking for. Fear that the call of God he placed in your life will come about. Even if you're 85 years old, the Spirit of God helping us, we will take Hebron. We'll take that hard land. There is nothing that can keep us. Like Elijah, the Lord of rain and food, from the ravens. Like Peter and John, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon us in power when we need it. Amen. Let's lead 4.13, since we're already there. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw. Leave now. They were ordinary, unschooled men. And their response to the power of God is, leave now. I can't handle it. I don't know what to say or do to this. I, this isn't normal. This isn't natural. You men are fishermen. Anybody in here felt like you were underqualified? <laughs> you didn't go to seminary? Perhaps you weren't a college graduate? Perhaps you spent your life fishing, and that's the only trade that you knew how to make a living at. When the Spirit of God comes upon man, he astounds the wisdom of the wise, takes those who are well-learned. See, the Pharisees, they would put any one of us to shame with their knowledge of the Old Testament. And yet, with a few willing men who are ready to die to bring life and inherit suffering and glory with Christ, he astonished the nations just like he did with Samuel and Hannah, just like he did with Peter and John. Ordinary men, an old man too weak to fight, a barren woman. It's just a few examples in the word. You know what I speak. It's always about those who do not have what they need to succeed, but are willing to try anyway and trust that God will meet them. But I want to challenge you. Is there an area of your life that you haven't trusted God like you know that you need to? Whether it be your career, your family, your home life. Is there some way that love, lucid love for the Lord is not defining my very action? I'm not fearlessly proclaiming the gospel and hunting for his glory. Let's go to, back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1.
1 and verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. If you find yourself hating your brothers, perhaps we haven't purified ourselves, because that, that's the start of it all. If we're not right with God, don't expect to be right with man that you can't see. We'll read Galatians 6 in a minute. Love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. When every one of us in this room fall like grass in a fire, when all the men that persecute us now are burned up like grass thrown into a fire. The words of God that are spoken through us, just like in Hannah's prayer, it will thunder in eternity. Acts of obedience that were against the grain will thunder through eternity, and everything else is going to be burned up. When we choose to do what is hard, we choose to do what is right, God says that praise, glory, and honor are all ascribed to it when we suffer like Christ did. See, in my few years, I've seen men like to feel like what they do every day is worthwhile. That's why they talk so much about how much they make, what cars they drive, how wonderful they made their life for their family. It's all a ruse. It's going to burn up like grass. The only thing that's going to matter on that day is what we did or did not do in the name of the Lord because that will thunder through his voice. It'll rain in our ears and our enemies' ears. What about your life is going to thunder like a memorial before heaven? That 1 John 4, perfect love. We're not going to turn there, but keep in mind that perfect love is what drives out fear. For our last scripture, let's go to Revelation 12. This is a familiar scripture to most of you. As it should be. Tenth verse. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accusers of brothers, of our brothers, who accuse them before our God day and night. They're men who have been accusing you day and night. He has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. See, the reason it brings glory to God is it's not the men who are persecuting you. It's their gods, the things that they serve, like Exodus 12, 12 tells us. It says... They love their lives not so much as to shrink back. What I ask you tonight is do you love him enough to step up? Do you love him enough to fearlessly obey? We know not to shrink back. But what puts you in a situation where you might want to shrink back? You have to step up into the firing line. It's time to step up and fearlessly obey. If you stand here, and you see that fear is what's actually dominated your life, that you don't remember a time where the Lord set you free from it, where you were no longer bound in darkness, and yet you know the scripture and sit in this church, I can testify myself that you are not born again and that you can be. The knowing the word of God will not redeem you alone. The resurrection power must be alive inside of you. If you don't want to hold on to fear and you have come to call upon the name of God, you know that he saved you and you do not have that Holy Spirit power that Peter and John spoke about that enabled them to speak boldly and do what was right even when it was hard, you can be filled with his Holy Spirit. But you have to be willing to do whatever it takes to get it. And if you've been born again, filled with his Holy Spirit, like I and many of the other men in this room have been. And you know there are some areas of your life that you weren't operating as one 
who sees clearly because of their love for God and hunts for the glory, hunts for suffering, and you know that you must make a change, that tomorrow is not going to be the same, that when I see my relatives at Thanksgiving, it's not going to be the same, that I am not content just to play nice anymore. No matter what state you're in, a barren woman, an old man, or ignorant fisherman, if we are ready to call upon the name of God, we can put the gods that have ruled our life to death. Whether it is idolatry or it's your only God, it'll fall tonight if you want it to. It had to in my own life. So will we step up or will we let the moment pass us by? Oh. I want to pray. Do whatever you feel the Holy Spirit leading you to do. Because you guys know me, and I know that I had to stand before the King of Kings and alter the way that I live. And if I had to, take a look at your own life. Must things change? Father, Lord, I set my own soul before you. Lord, I say I thank you for your resurrection power your love that you demonstrated so that I could learn to love you and drive out fear. Father, I ask that your spirit would move upon us. Lord, as men go out to leave our country and preach the gospel, that your spirit would come upon us in power. Lord, it would anoint us to heal the sick, raise the dead. Lord, there would be no good deed undone. Lord, that there would be no man left in submission to the gods of Egypt, the gods that have ruled his life in fear. Lord, that fear would be put underfoot tonight that every area of your kingdom might be conquered, that no good thing that you purchased would be left undone, that every area of our own hearts would be in complete submission to you. Holy One, I ask you to have your way in our hearts in this place tonight. At LCMF, we've learned to love honesty from the pulpit. This little tender olive shoot has grown up before your very eyes. And if he's honest and tells you he was backed into safe boundaries at work, you stay on your side of the fence and we'll stay on ours. Are there no brave men and women in this room that can be honest enough to say you were backed into your boundaries? Or are you setting the world on fire with evangelism now? On the topic of setting things on fire, Absalom asked Joab to come into his presence one time. And Joab ignored him. And Absalom asked him again. And Joab ignored him. And in 2 Samuel, the 14th chapter, Absalom set Joab's fields on fire. And then suddenly Joab showed up in his presence. He said, Why'd you set my fields on fire? Well, you wouldn't come any other way. Wouldn't it be a shame if the Lord of glory had to light your fields on fire to get his message across to you? Because in Acts 5.41, the apostles, they rejoiced at suffering for the kingdom. They rejoiced when they were beaten. They were looking for the chance to lay it on the line. They had that heart of David. In 2 Samuel 24, 24 is where David said, Far be it from me to offer my Lord a sacrifice that cost me nothing. So what is it costing you to live for Jesus today? My own son's testimony is that it wasn't costing him enough. And so he wanted to raise the stakes. Will an 18-year-old newlywed be the only man in this room that wants to raise the stakes? We're going to begin to worship. And I'm going to not ask that the Lord set your fields on fire. I'm going to ask that he set your hearts on fire. 
The only kind of loss that we're supposed to suffer now is the loss of self so that we can be recklessly abandoned to him. Throw caution to the wind. We all know each other's names in this room. And I'm going to spare you calling your name. But are you living a safe life? Or is your Christianity radical and dangerous? Are you on the edge of being fired because you can't help but tell? Because my 18-year-old son is. His companions at work are. And I don't think Jesus has ever been prouder. Has your Christianity become caged? There's a dying world out there, and they're waiting to find out who the sons of God are. They're waiting. They'll only know in one way. When they see the kind of people that can take a beating for the gospel and rejoice while others cry.